Uh, can I ask a quick question? Sure. About the notation. Uh, when you write uh, tilde tilde, the, the double tilde. Uh, okay. Do I write uh, double tilde? Like something like this? No. Uh, I, 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 oh, yes. Oh, when you like, like, evaluate yeah. like something. Just like something like that. Uh, how do I use this? Approximate. Uh, approximate. Yes, uh, I, I understand. In, yeah. Uh, so it, it is close in some sense, but does it have a precise definition? Uh, yes. Uh, by this, I mean, let's see, where did I use it? I used it somewhere. Um, yeah, the because I don't want to write out uh, all the epsilons and deltas uh, all over the place. Yeah, like so for here, I use this. Yeah. So what I use this is that I mean that with up to with respect to any epsilon greater than zero, uh, there exists a univector such that the difference of these two things is at norm less than epsilon. Um, okay, so you are uh, you mean these two? I, I just mean that the the difference uh, these are epsilon away. Uh, Asymptotically, they're as close as you want. Asymptotically, their difference uh, converges to zero and one. Zero. Oh. Yeah. So that's all I mean by by approximately equal to. It's just that uh, these are unit vectors, and I just mean that the the norm of their difference. Let me see and see in that uh, this converges to zero. That's all I mean. So this is Hilbert space norm, right? Okay. Uh, because I asked this because I thought uh, we need to take uh, xi, xi n so that the norm uh, over c n goes to zero. To uh, well, the c n's are just unit vectors. Mm -hmm. um, so what we needed, the key thing that we needed for this argument is we needed, uh, where did I use it? Uh, uh, so I needed that the eta ends, so the eta ends, remember, was uh, one over, I have a right, right here, one over square root of cn times the unit vector six cn. Mm -hmm. And so what I needed was, I needed that, yeah, so this, when I wrote approximate here, so I guess this is what you really, really need here. Uh, so what is this precisely? This is, precisely one over Cn and delta n. So this, uh, so we get the this delta S eta n squared. Uh, really, I just need that this is bounded. Uh, so the point is, is that this minus, uh, I guess, Cn, uh, is what, uh, oh, I see, I see what you I see what the complaint is. Okay, let me undo that so I don't forget about that. Uh, yeah, so here I just means that this is with respect to any epsilon. So the epsilon I'm going to take here uh, isn't just that it goes to zero, but you can take that this, uh, by this approximate, I mean that there for every epsilon, um, for every Cn and every epsilon, there is some Cn such that this is within epsilon. So specifically, the Cn I'll take is such that this difference is um, will be less than, uh, say, Cn times epsilon, or Cn times one over n. Yes, that that makes sense to me. Yeah, is that better? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been a bit more precise. So the when I write approximate here, the CNs are what's what we can choose to be approximately equal to this, but we'll need them better and better for each CN for each C. Yes. Right. So this is the type of inequality we'll need. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions? All right. Which, like I said, is guaranteed by the spectral theorem because we have a self-adjoint operator. We have an element of its spectrum. So therefore, uh, 
an element of the spectrum doesn't need to be an eigenvalue, but it can be as close as you want to an eigenvalue, right? And we can choose that eigenvalue after, uh, I mean, that's that approximate is independent of the value itself. Right? Okay. Uh, so what we finished uh, proving last time is we just finished proving uh, this theorem right here. Uh, that is that if you're finitely generated, then you have property T if and only if the reduced cohomology vanishes for all representations. Uh, so, uh, of course, we know that if you have property T, then the cohomology itself vanishes. So this is really useful in the other way around. In fact, we'll use this today. Uh, this shows that if you can show the reduced cohomology always vanishes, then you have property T. That's the useful direction here. Uh, okay, and so now that's exactly what I want to, uh, to do. So here's the, so I want to prove to you today that SL3Z has property T. So here's the theorem, SL3Z has T. And originally this was proved by showing that SL3R has T, which was proved shortly after Kajdan's work in the, in the 60s. So this result has been known from the late 60s, early 70s, maybe. Um, Kajdan proved that SLN has Z, but I think he needed N greater than or equal to four. SLNR has T, but he needed N greater than or equal to four, but I think it was maybe a year or two after him that this was improved to SL3R. So once you know that SL3R has T, well, Kajdan himself proved prove that property T passes to lattices, and so you and SL3Z is a lattice in SL3R. Uh, but that's not the proof we'll give today. We'll just give a direct proof that uh, SL3Z has property T. So here's one proof, which is cheating a little bit. Uh, so here's one proof, so first proof. And it's cheating because I'm going to use one fact, which is considered a well-known fact, but I'm not going to prove that fact. That's why it's cheating a little bit. And this is uh, a fact established by uh, Carter and Keller in 83. And that is that uh, every element of SL3Z is a product of at most uh, 48 elementary matrices. All right, so uh, elementary matrix for us, we have, uh, that just means that you have ones down the diagonals and exactly one other term, which is non-zero. So this, it's a matrix of the form for SL3. So you have this, and then you have uh, one more, uh, one more uh, term that's not zero. So that's an elementary matrix. So maybe it's there or somewhere else. So there are six possible choices for SL3Z. Uh, so these are elementary matrices. Uh, and Carter and Keller showed in 83 that any uh, matrix in SL3Z is a product of 48 matrices of these types. So why does this fact help us prove property T? Because we know that each elementary, each elementary matrix lives in the subgroup generated by if you put a one here and that subgroup has relative property t uh, and why is that that's because for instance for this copy right here you have a copy of sl2z uh, semi-direct product z squared but if you take another elementary matrix say down here well now you have another copy by these two things of SL2Z semi-direct product Z squared. Or if you take a copy up here, well then by rearranging permuting rows, you get another copy of SL2Z uh, direct product Z squared. So every elementary matrix uh, lives in this subgroup. So they have these six different subgroups and they all have relative property T, right? 
So IE SL3Z is boundedly generated. So I shouldn't say IE, I should say therefore. Therefore SL3Z is boundedly generated by six subgroups. There'll be cyclic subgroups, uh, each having relative property T. Uh, but this automatic, so if you're boundedly generated by subgroups with relative property T, then you have relative, then you have property T. Why is that? So if C mapping gamma to H is any co-cycle, so then uh, on each subgroup, Uh, it is bounded because we know the subgroups have relative property T and one characterization we saw is that every co-cycle is bounded. So we know in each subgroup it's bounded uh, say by M and therefore if we have T and this is equal to T1, T2 up to T48, um, if we have, it's a product of at most 48 of these uh, with TI in these subgroups. So then the co-cycle at T, we can estimate its norm and you just use the co-cycle relation and then the triangle inequality and you get that this is less than or equal to 48 times your bound on the subgroups. Uh, hence, this co-cycle is bounded. So we showed an arbitrary co-cycle is bounded. Uh, so therefore, we have property T. Uh, so therefore, H1 gamma pi is always trivial, implies uh, gamma well, SO3Z. T. All right, so that's the first proof, uh, except we rely on this uh, fact due to Carter and Keller, although albeit a well-known fact, but maybe this is especially cheating because Carter and Keller proved this fact after it was already known that SL3Z has property T. So, um, okay. But this idea of bounded generation of using the fact that we can boundedly generate something, uh, we can use this to, to give another proof that SL3Z has property T. And this one we can actually verify all the details with. We don't have to rely on, on um, you know, outsourcing to some result. So let me give you a second proof now. Uh, so the second proof is going to use, uh, so this is a, an approach due to Shalom, and this uses some structural theory of SL3Z. So specifically, I'm going to uh, set, we'll consider three subgroups of SL3Z. Uh, so H is going to be the subgroup of all matrices that in their upper left corner, the upper left two by two matrix, they can be anything. Uh, one in the bottom right, and then zeros like this. Uh, so this, all matrices of this form. So this will be a subgroup of SL3Z. So by that, I mean matrices have to satisfy. So these, these two by two matrix has to be an element of SL2Z, right? So this is a copy of SL2Z. Uh, we're also gonna define sigma one. So it's gonna be matrices of this form. So it'll again be a subgroup of SL3Z. In fact, this is isomorphic to Z squared. Uh, and then we'll have sigma two to be this subgroup, the subgroup of matrices of this form. Uh, and this is also isomorphic to Z squared under matrix multiplication. Uh, moreover, the thing to, one thing to notice is that the subgroup H normalizes both of these and the, the action by conjugation 
uh, on sigma one is just the usual left multiplication by matrices. And the action by conjugation on sigma two is, I guess, uh, right multiplication or if you like left multiplication by the inverse transfer transpose. Uh, but in either case, you get that the subgroup generated by H and sigma I and uh, is isomorphic to SL2Z. I already mentioned this in the last proof. Uh, semi-direct product z squared, uh, and hence sigma i uh, has relative property t. Property t in SL32. Right, it has relative property t in this semi-direct product, and so it has relative property t in any larger group. All right, so that's one thing. Both of these subgroups have relative property T. Uh, the other thing we need is that um, uh, these two subgroups, sigma one and sigma two, generate SL3C. So also SL3C is generated by these two subgroups, sigma one and sigma two. That's an easy exercise I'll leave to you guys. Uh, and then the last thing we need is we need this little lemma, which says that we do have bounded generation in SL3Z, but this lemma is much, much easier. We don't show it for elementary matrices, but we just throw, show it for these three subgroups. So the lemma is that uh, SL3Z, you can do this explicit. This is going to be, uh, Sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, sigma two, H. So any matrix in SL3Z will be a product of at most five matrices from these subgroups. All right, and this is nice because you can actually do this by hand. Uh, so let me go ahead and give a proof of this. So the proof is we'll fix uh, gamma and let's suppose this will be an SL3Z and you know it has some entries up here. We don't know what they are. And let's call the entries in the bottom row X, Y, and Z. And this is some, some matrix here. And what do we know? Well, it's a matrix in SL3Z. So this tells us that the greatest common divisor of X, Y, and Z has to be one uh, because otherwise we get some relation in there and that would uh, that would not, uh, we couldn't undo it. Uh, so we know that the GCD of X, Y, and Z is equal to one. Well, what does this mean? This means that by a simple uh, application of the Chinese remainder theorem, Uh, this implies that there exists some integer m such that if we look at uh, x plus mz, that this is congruent to one uh, mod mod p. And this is for any prime P dividing Y such that P does not divide Z. All right, so that's an application of the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, and what does this mean? This means that we then get, so we therefore get that this number together with Y have GCD equal one. So therefore, the G creates common divisor of X plus MZ, Y is equal to one. All right, so what does this mean? This means that if we take our uh, gamma and so X, Y, Z, and we multiply it by this matrix here, which I just, uh, we need to pick up in M, 
the yeah so we just put an m right there there we go so this number this product of these matrices is a matrix of this form and now we have x prime so x prime is exactly this element up here y z and now we have that the gcd of x prime and y is equal to one. All right, so now I'm going to use another um, uh, consequence of the Chinese remainder theorem or uh, Hold on one moment. Uh, I need to catch up on my notes here. Yeah, so now the next step is that we use another application of the Chinese remainder theorem, or I think this has a name. Uh, um, that is that if you have two numbers with GCD equal to one, then you can find two integers such that you get a linear combination equaling one. Uh, so therefore, there exists some S and T integers such that S X prime plus T Y is equal to one. Well, what does that mean? That means that therefore, if we take this matrix X prime Y Z and multiply it by S T, Zero, zero, zero. Now this gives us a new matrix, which is of this form. And I guess the only thing that's important for us uh, is that the last term should be uh, now I'm not happy I want to make the last term one uh oh that's fine we can do this such that this is equal to one minus z so we get this plus z equals one that's what we need right so we just multiply by one minus z and we get this okay so now what we get is we get that the last term here is now equal to one and what the other terms were doesn't really matter i guess we'll keep them in um, so the last terms will be well, I guess some S prime, let me use different letters here. You, you V, and we still have X prime Y. Here. Okay, so now it's a little messy. So now the last step is we use just an elementary computation, which just says that if we take this matrix, one, 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 zero, 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 negative U, negative E, multiplied by this new matrix we got, U equals one X prime Y, and then multiply by this matrix, one, one, zero, zero, negative X prime, negative Y, and you just compute this and you get that this is a matrix of the form 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, which is an H. Okay, so putting this together, what do we what do we see? We started with our original matrix. Uh, we multiplied on the right here once, uh, and we got this. We multiplied on the right. So this is in sigma 2. Oh, maybe I got the ones and twos mixed up. We'll see. Uh, this is in sigma one. This is in sigma two. This is in sigma one. So we get that therefore, uh, and this is in H. So we get the therefore uh, gamma. We get the sigma one times gamma times. Uh, this is this one, which we already know was 
uh, times this is sigma two, now sigma one, and now this last sigma two, this is in H. Or in other words, uh, so this is a subset of H. So we get that therefore, or maybe not a subset, but has non-trivial intersection. Intersect H is non-trivial. So we get that therefore gamma is contained in rearranging things, we get uh, sigma one, H sigma two, sigma one, sigma two. But of course, H normalizes everything so we can just shove it to the right. So it's equal to sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, sigma two H. All right, so that proves, proves the lemma. Okay, so this is an elementary lemma showing that SL3Z is boundedly generated uh, by certain subgroups. Uh, of course, the disadvantage here is that we don't know yet that H has relative property T. So if we knew that H had relative property T, then we could apply the previous argument and we'd be done. Uh, so we have to still do some work, but fortunately there's this uh, very nice argument of Shalom that I'll present right now. So here's the second uh, proof that SL3Z has T. And like I said, this is Shalom. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to show that the reduced cohomology always vanishes. So specifically, we'll prove this, uh, let's call it a theorem that says that if uh, gamma is boundedly, well, if gamma's, let me be a bit more explicit here. So if gamma is a group, uh, finitely generated group uh, H sigma one and sigma two are subgroups of gamma such that one, you have that gamma, the pair gamma sigma I has relative T, I equals one and two. Uh, two, you have that H normalizes sigma one and sigma two. Three, you have that gamma is generated by sigma one and sigma two. And four, you have that gamma is boundedly generated by all three groups, H, sigma one, sigma two, so then gamma has property T. So we see that SL3Z fits, fits this. And I should mention that uh, there are abstractions of this, so there are other groups which satisfy this. In fact, uh, the SL3Z adjoin, um, adjoin an indeterminate uh, also satisfies these three things. Um, and indeed, there are many many SL3s of many rings, which you can construct in this similar way. And so you can prove property T for all these. All right, so let me go ahead and prove Shalom's, you know, so in other words, that uh, Shalom's technique was indeed able to give exam new examples of groups of property T um, beyond just giving a new proof to SL3 T. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, prove this. Well, like I said, we're going to prove this by showing that the reduced cohomology always vanishes. So, um, so we'll fix a representation by uh, and we will show. Uh, H1 reduced of gamma with respect to this is equal to zero. So this is going to be our strategy. So the first thing to notice is that uh, note that if C mapping gamma to H is a cocycle, 
and uh, P is the projection onto the space of invariant vectors, which I'll denote H to the gamma. This is the space of gamma invariant vectors. Well, then what do we know? We know that then uh, P times C uh, is a co-cycle into the trivial representation. So that just means it's a homomorphism. So this is a homomorphism. Uh, into the range of this prediction. So view this into this uh, Hilbert space, which we just view as an additive group. Right? But in particular, this uh, Hilbert space as an additive group is torsion free. So if you have any homomorphism uh, being bounded on a, uh, is the same as being zero. And since we know that sigma one and sigma two have relative T, so since, sigma i and relative t, uh, we have that pc restricted to sigma i is identically zero because it's a homomorphism and has to be the zero, therefore the zero homomorphism. Uh, but on the other hand, these two sigma i's generate the group. So this implies that uh, pc restricted to the group they generate is identically zero, uh, which is the whole group gamma. Right? So let's see what we're doing. So therefore, any co-cycle into H when we restrict to the space of invariant vectors is automatically zero. So we might as well restrict to the orthogonal complement and we'll assume that H has no invariant vectors. So therefore, we suppose that H has no invariant. By restricting to the orthogonal complement. All right, so now we'll show that cocycles in, into this um, are all approximately inner. And so what we'll do there is that we also note, so now fix uh, some cocycle C from gamma to H, one cocycle. And so since Sigma i has relative has relative t in gamma. Um, therefore, we know that the cocycle is inner when restricted to sigma i. So there exists some vector uh, c i in H such that the cocycle at uh, say g is just equal to c i minus i g c i. And this is for all G in sigma i. Uh, moreover, uh, if we chose two, if two, if there were two vectors that satisfied this cocycle identity, then we see that their difference is an invariant vector for sigma i. So by taking by taking the projection to the orthogonal complement, we may assume that that's zero, and then we get a unique vector which does this. Right, so moreover, CI becomes unique. Uh, there is a unique, what I mean to say is, uh, there is a unique CI such that the projection, so PI, I'm gonna denote this the projection, onto the space of sigma i invariant vectors, uh, such that for this projection, we have that the pi ci is equal to zero. Right, so we just, the whole subspace of, or the whole, there's a whole affine subspace of vectors which do this, and we'll just choose the one that's orthogonal to the space of invariant. Right, just by subtracting. And then it becomes unique. So therefore, for every co-cycle, we have a unique C1 and we have a unique C2. Uh, these depend on the co-cycle. So let me put a superscript C here just to emphasize that they depend on the co-cycle. All right, so now what can we do? Uh, now I'm going to, again, 
define an inner product on the space of co-cycles uh, in such a way that it uh, gives us the topology we want on co-cycles. So specifically, uh, we embed uh, the space of co-cycles into each direction H uh, by taking a co-cycle and just taking it to this C1, C direct sum, C2, C. And obviously this is a linear map. Yeah. And what's also uh, maybe slightly less obvious, but still almost as obvious, is that uh, this gives the topology on the space of cosecycles, pointwise convergence, right? Because this topology, you get that it's pointwise convergence on uh, each of the sigma i's, but again, since the sigma i's generate gamma, the cocycle radiation gives you pointwise convergence overall, right? So this gives the topology is the topology on the space. It's just pointwise convergence. Uh, but the advantage of putting it into a Hilbert space is that now we can look at orthogonal complements of the inner vectors and see what that is. And we want to just show that that is. So suppose now, suppose C is a cocycle that is orthogonal to the space of inner cocycles with respect to this inner product. And then we just need to see that this cocycle has to be zero. So we'll fix, uh, we'll fix this. So this is fixed. Maybe. We'll fix this cocycle here that's orthogonal to the space of inner cocycles. And the goal is to show that this cocycle is. Well, let's see what exactly it means uh, for this cocycle to be orthogonal to the space of inner cocycles. I apologize. I have to go to the next screen and we're going to. I have one question before we go to the next screen. Oh, good. That'll give people a chance to copy down or take a screenshot if they want. Now, go ahead. Uh, why did we get that this is a, a unique CI uh, dependent on C? Uh, well, I think the, the remark I made is that we have some CI here. So we can al always we replace CI C with uh, the orthogonal complement here. So we can always replace that because changing CI by an invariant vector uh, doesn't change this equation, right? Because the pi g will be invariant and we'll just add and subtract the same thing. So we can always replace ci with its projection to the orthogonal complement of the space of sigma i invariant vectors. But now I claim that, so there exists a vector there that implements the cocycle, but I claim that this vector is unique. And indeed, if you had two vectors there, then you see that the cocycle relation, you would have this equality for both of them which would exactly say that their difference is an invariant vector. But since they're both orthogonal to the space of invariant vectors, so is their difference. So their difference is in the intersection of the space of invariant vectors plus the orthogonal complement. So it's zero. Hmm. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why this is unique, right? It exists by just this, but then you see if you had two of them, their difference would be invariant and also orthogonal to the space of invariant vectors. Uh, so therefore that gives us uniqueness. All right, uh, so therefore we put this inner product on it and now we're gonna fix a cocycle which is orthogonal to the inner cocycles and we're gonna show that this cocycle has to be zero. That's how we're gonna proceed. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So first, let's see, just like we did before, when we had we had a different embedding, which was given by the words, the cocycle and the value of uh, words for finding generation, and that gave us harmonic cocycles. Well, here again, we'll see what does it mean to be orthogonal to the inner cocycles, and then that'll give us some information. So we have that C is orthogonal to the space of inner cocycles. So therefore, 
uh, what do we have? We have that for every C and H. We have, oh, first, uh, by the way, if C is an H, then what are these corresponding code cycles for the inner code cycles? Uh, so then maybe that's the remark before we, we do this. So note, if C is an H and C sub C uh, denotes the corresponding inner co-cycle, so G equals C minus Y G C. Well, then this is already an inner co-cycle. So when you restrict it to the subgroup sigma I, it's again inner there, but that's not the sigma, that's not these C I's that we're looking for because we need them to be orthogonal. So in this case, we get that uh, C1 or C, I guess to be fit with my notation before, it's this vector, but that looks too ugly, so I won't write that. Uh, but therefore, we see that uh, the corresponding C1 is going to be exactly equal to the orthogonal complement of P1 of C, and we get that C2 is the orthogonal complement of P2 of C, right? So these are the two vectors that we pick up when we start with an inner cycle. All right, so now since we have our cycles orthogonal to the space of inner cycles, uh, we have that this inner product here with this cycle, so this inner product here, so this is zero, C, C, but from our embedding, what do we see this is? Well, we see that it's the first vector implemented by this inner product with the first corresponding vector here, P1 for C, plus the second vector, C, C, inner product with the orthogonal complement of the space of invariant vectors for sigma two there. But now these are just projections. There are projections to the orthogonal complement. So you can move them across in the inner product and we can rewrite this as, uh, oh, and by the way, of course, we already know that C1 of C is orthogonal to the space of sigma one invariant vectors. So actually we could just remove this because we already know that this is in that subspace. And similarly, we could remove this because it's already in C2 C is already orthogonal to the space of sigma two invariant uh, vectors. So therefore we can just remove those two things and then combine this and this just, just says C1 C plus C2 C inner product C is zero. And that's for every vector C, which just means that this vector, which is the sum of these two is zero. So you get therefore C1 C plus C2 C is equal to zero. Right, so the fact that our cycle is orthogonal to the inner cycles exactly says that we have this relationship between these two vectors C1 and C2. So whatever vector implements the inner cycle on sigma one is the negative of the vector that implements the cycle on sigma two. So already we should think hmm, that's a little strange that condition and indeed we'll show that it's uh, it's a little too strange. All right, so, but we're not quite there yet, yet because we haven't used anywhere that say H normalizes uh, the CI. So let's use that now. So, uh, I'm sorry, so I, I think I might have missed this. Um, how do you define the, the this inner product on the core cycles? Yeah, that's right here. So I embed the space of co cycles oh. into H for XM H by just its values at the these two vectors that implement the co cycle on these two subgroups. Right, right, right. And so then the inner product of these two co cycles exactly is just the inner the sum of the inner product of these corresponding vectors. And like I said, uh, for a vector C, we have an explicit description. So we get this and then we get this equation. Right, so if a cycle is orthogonal to the space of inner cycles in this, in this uh, with respect to this inner product, that's exactly saying this. Uh, 
Oh, by the way, I should uh, also remark here that this embedding is complete. So the range of this embedding is complete so that it makes sense to look at orthogonal complements. So this is uh, not just an embedding, it's, it's a homeomorphism from this onto its image, a linear homeomorphism. And that's, again, easy to see that it's complete. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so uh, what can we do here? Well, now let's use the fact that H normalizes. So if H is an H uh, and we have T in one of the subgroups, sigma I, so then let's go ahead and compute uh, what this is. So we have here, we'll do computation. So we have, so then, C I C minus I H T H inverse C I C. Well, this is just the inner co-cycle corresponding to C I and H T H inverse is in sigma I. So this is nothing but the co-cycle at H T H inverse. But now we have a co-cycle of a product, so we can use the co-cycle relation. So this is the co-cycle at H plus pi of H times the co-cycle at T plus pi at uh, H T times the co-cycle at H inverse. And that's the co-cycle relation. And now the thing to notice, of course, is T is also in sigma I. So it's also given implemented by this inner vector. So this is cocycle H plus I of H times CI C minus I of T CI uh, C. And now here's cocycle at an inverse is just exactly pi of h and it's the negative of pi h inverse times the cocycle of c so here i can change this to negative pi h t h inverse um cocycle h all right so that's uh the cocycle relation mm -hmm. lily wants to come in uh so now but we can massage this around a little bit uh, specifically, uh, I want to notice from here that uh, if we look at T, uh, hold on, I want to massage this a little bit more. Uh, that I'm happy with. I want to put parentheses. Yeah, I want to collect this term and this term. And then here we, so here we can rewrite this as C of H plus I of H C I C. And now we have minus, and now I'm going to pull out a pi of H T H inverse. And now what's left over is uh, for this term, we have, uh, since we pull out an H T H inverse, we still have pi of H C I C. And now here we have minus C H. All right, people are happy with that. Uh, so what does this mean? Uh, so this means here we have pi of h t h inverse, pi of h t h inverse. So let's collect those terms. So we get therefore, uh, if we look at, uh, so I'll collect those, these terms on the right and the other terms on the left. So we get c i c minus c of h minus pi of h c i c is equal to pi h T H inverse, and here we have, we move this to the other side, so we get C I C, and we still have minus C of H, 
Uh, I see I made a mistake here. It should be a plus since I put it within the parentheses. So it becomes a minus. And now we have here minus pi of h c i c. All right, so we get this equation and this holds for all t n sigma i. So in other words, what this is saying is that this vector here is invariant, right? It's the same vector. This is sigma i invariant. Or in other words, if we apply the orthogonal complement, then we just get zero. So we get that therefore, if we look at pi perp and apply this to ch, well, this is the same as pi perp of we can just add we can just add this invariant vector because that's zero uh, when we apply pi perp and when we do that we get c i c minus pi h c i c right because i just added uh, zero by adding the projection onto the orthogonal complement of an invariant vector but now we use the fact that CIC itself is, um, is in this orthogonal complement. And of course that, since H normalizes CI, it preserves the subspace. So this is equal to CIC minus pi H CIC. But now I use the fact that CI is the opposite of C, it's the negative of CJ. So let me, this is all for, now I can put in ones here. So let me put in one here. And now we use that C1C is negative C2C. So this is negative of C2C minus pi H C2C. But now I plug this back into the formula above and we see that this is negative P2 per of C of H. Okay, now we're almost done with the proof because now we move both the P perps on the same side and we get the therefore P1 perp plus P2 perp applied to the cocycle at H is zero. And now this is a sum of projections. In particular, it's a positive operator. Uh, it's greater than projections. So therefore the projections themselves also have to kill C of H. So this implies since, so since P1 perp plus P2 perp is greater than or equal to PI perp, which is greater than or equal to zero in this orthogonal projection. So this is a, implies that PI perp applies CH is equal to zero. So that's just the spectral theorem there again. So that means that therefore C of H, uh, what is it? It's in the space of sigma one invariant vectors, but it's also in the space of sigma two invariant vectors. And since sigma one and sigma two generate the group, this is in the space of invariant vectors that they generate. And way back at the beginning of the proof, we, we already redu reduced the case that that's the zero subspace. And this was for all H in H. So the co-cycle has to automatically be zero on H, uh, but we already know it's bounded on sigma one and sigma two. And we know that H sigma one and sigma two boundedly generate the group. We haven't used that assumption yet. And so now we can apply the same proof I gave you in the first proof to conclude that the co-cycle is bounded. Uh, so since gamma is boundedly generated,
by h sigma one sigma two. Uh, it follows that C is bounded and hence inner. Hence inner. And we already know it's orthogonal to the inner ones, so hence zero. And that was an arbitrary closed cycle, so that finishes the proof. All right. So there's a lot to digest there, uh, but this is a very nice proof. Uh, it's a very clever proof. So I should uh, remark if this is looking a little out of the blue, that this is not the way that Shalom proved it. It is Shalom's proof, but it's not the way he proved it. Um, another correspondence for property T is that um, any property T, so for any co-cycle, you have a natural, maybe I'll do this on the page. So if you have a co-cycle, So then what does the co-cycle give you? It gives you an affine action on H by uh, say, let's call that affine action alpha. Alpha T C is equal to pi of T C plus the co-cycle of T. So affine action just means it preserves lines. Um, and it's an affine isometric action, affine isometric, affine isometric action. And conversely, every affine isometric action uh, gives you a co-cycle. So you have this correspondence between affine isometric actions and co-cycles, at least if you restrict to real Hilbert spaces. There, there's a bijection between these. Uh, and so then everything you can phrase here, uh, you can phrase everything you can phrase for co-cycles, you can phrase in terms of affine isometric actions. Uh, in particular, the existence of a fixed point then becomes when the co-cycles uh, inner and you have a, an approximate fixed point you can talk about. And, uh, and then maybe the, it becomes a bit more geometric, the picture. And this is how Shalom uh, came up with his proof by using this geometric picture from looking at affine isometric actions. And what I've presented here is really just the translation of Shalom's proof into the space of co-cycles, uh, just because we'll deal with co-cycles a little bit later in the semester, so it's nice to become a little bit familiar. All right, so here's a good place to stop. Uh, so we finally proved this theorem. So on Monday, we'll uh, start with the Hagar property. And I think we should be able to move pretty quickly because we've done a lot of preliminaries about positive definite functions, uh, unitary representations, et cetera, co-cycles. Um, so we'll move quickly through Hagar property and then maybe move on to weak immutability or something like this, or applications to two and factors maybe. All right, any questions before we go? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how did you get that? Uh... Maybe I'm getting confused. You have that uh, P1 perf plus P2 perf. How do you get that those are projections? So how do you get that they are? Well, P, P1, remember P1 is just the defined to be the orthogonal projection onto the space of sigma one invariant vectors. Mm -hmm. So of course, P1 perf is just the orthogonal project, the projection onto the orthogonal complement. So they're by definition projections. Uh, the sum is not not a projection in general. The sum will just be oh, okay. a positive operator. If if they're not, yeah, if these two projections. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. However, it is true that uh, you know if you have some a kernel of the positive operator, then it'll you'll also be in the kernel of this sub. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And that's what yes. I'm. Saying. All right. Uh, any other questions? All right, fantastic.